going to tell you about an organization I work for whose purpose is to make the world a better place. And we make the world a better place by striving to eliminate chemical weapons. And if you think about chemical weapons, you might think about chemistry. And chemistry is very interesting. Take this picture here. This is chlorine, something you might see in a chemistry lesson. It doesn't look like anything very dangerous, does it? But it was one of the first chemicals to be used on an industrial scale in warfare in the First World War. And the Chemical Weapons Treaty that I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes has a um, list of chemicals, schedules we call them, of chemicals that the countries that sign the treaty need to pay particular attention to in how they regulate chemistry and chemicals within their borders. But if you look at that list, a quite complicated list, chlorine is nowhere to be found. Chlorine, of course, used as a weapon is still a violation of the treaty, and it's certainly regulated, just not under laws specific to a chemical weapons treaty. Which begs the question, what kind of chemicals must be on this treaty? Well, very nasty things. Nerve agents that inhibit biological functions, mustard agents that cause blisters, one of the worst chemical weapons used in the First World War. But interesting thing about mustard agents, you might have heard of a compound chemical called nitrogen mustard. It's actually used as a chemotherapy drug. Can you imagine that? A chemical warfare agent that's actually on that list, but is also used in medicine. And how many chemicals actually are there? Scientists come up with about 15,000 new chemicals every day that get added into a database that uh, tracks these things. That's about 155 million more chemicals in that database today in 2016 than there was in 1993. That's the uh, dotted line on that chart when that chemical weapons convention or treaty that I, that I mentioned was first signed. How do diplomats and policymakers make decisions about chemistry? This uh, room that you see here on the screen is hardly a lab or hardly a classroom to learn about science. But science and chemistry in particular have influence over diplomatic negotiations. Take, for example, the events in Syria. Science alone certainly won't won't put, a, put an end to everything that's going on there. But in 2013, it was chemistry, chemistry results from scientists that influenced decision makers to negotiate the removal of 1,300 metric tons of toxic chemicals associated with the chemical warfare program out of Syria and have them destroyed within a year. Those chemists, of course, don't wear white lab coats. They dress more like this. And as a science policy advisor and science advisor, I get to talk to diplomats and explain the science behind the chemistry that not only is chemical weapons, but is used to protect people against chemical weapons. The treaty that I'm, I'm speaking about was open for signature in 1993. It's about to enter its 20th anniversary being enforced from 1997. And we have 192 countries, states parties, the diplomats call them, that are adherent to this treaty. The OPCW, for its work in chemical disarmament, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2013. And if you think about this work about destroying chemical weapons, take, for example, this purple, this purple line at the top of this chart. That's the number, total number of chemical weapons, chemicals, that have been produced and declared by countries that are members of this treaty that, are, that they're obligated to destroy. And what they're obligated to destroy is everything shown in black that has been destroyed. That's pretty amazing. More than 70,000 metric tons of chemicals that militaries have put up for destruction, and mo oh, more than 90% of it in 2016 has actually been destroyed. How does one actually destroy chemical weapons? Well, you need to know some chemistry. So that's pretty amazing. Chemistry is chemical weapons, but chemistry also makes chemical weapons go away. Pretty cool. How does one actually implement a chemical weapons convention? Well, I told you about the destruction of chemical weapons. There's also nonproliferation. And what this means in some of the activities that the OPCW does is that international chemical weapons inspectors go around the world and visit chemical facilities, commercial facilities, in countries that are, are members of this treaty. Can you imagine that? Chemical weapons inspectors, at the, and not opposed by the governments of those countries, coming in and checking things out in a chemical production facility? It's all about transparency and, sh and the countries showing that they have nothing to hide. And then there's two other aspects of treaty implementation. Countries helping, them, helping each other, building trust with one another, because that's how treaties work. And 
How does this work? Countries provide emergency response assistance to one another in case of a chemical incident, and they also use science, chemistry, to build international collaborations, Chemistry, chemists collaborating on science projects across international borders, chemistry for peace, if you will. So, as a science policy advisor, what do I do? I get to talk to politicians and, and diplomats. Um, the man on the right is the director general of the OPCW, because in their decision making, they're often given information that come from my colleagues who might dress like this, and they need to understand something about the scientific dimensions in the decisions that they're making. And on, on other days, I get to work with interns and students from universities and talk about science and talk about how science and chemistry influence a chemical weapons treaty. Fun stuff, because science is fun, but science also can influence decision making on an international level. And in the end, science is not the only solution, but it was definitely an important ingredient in making the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs>